Late on December 9th, 2018, around 11.30 p.m. and into the early morning hours of December 10th, 2018. For around 13 minutes, Felipe Luis Jr., Derek Alexander Donato, and Julian Luis Gonzalez attacked 36-year-old fellow Norteño gang member Jacob Capone Ozuna, a career criminal with multiple violent convictions who was currently sitting in the fourth floor of the Yakima County Jail on a very heinous murder charge. That murder charge was from a going away party on May 10th, 2018 to celebrate a man's move by the name of Dario Alvarado, who was 35 years old at the time and getting ready to move to the west side of the state. The Pacific Northwest Violent Offenders Task Force says six-time convicted felon and dangerous gang member Jacob Ozuna, who went by the name of Capone, was the deadly shooting suspect in the murder of Dario Alvarado. They say the two men were at the party with friends and family when an argument broke out. Soon, Jacob Ozuna pulled a firearm out and began shooting at Dario Alvarado, who attempted to flee and hide behind a vehicle. However, the occupants of said vehicle, for obvious reasons, got scared and sped off, leaving Alvarado and Ozuna and nothing in between them. Ozuna unloaded the clip in that gun, actually grabbed a second gun, and unloaded that one as well. Dario Alvarado was pronounced dead at the scene, and Jacob Capone Ozuna went on the run. A $1 million warrant was issued for first-degree murder, two counts of first-degree assault, and unlawful possession of a firearm. Jacob Ozuna ended up being arrested in Hardin, Montana some months later after coming out of a convenience store, being seen by authorities, running, and ultimately being tased. Authorities believe that the shooting was gang-related and possibly drug-related as both, as both men were documented Norteño gang members. Jacob Ozuna was brought back to Washington, booked into the Yakima County Jail, and placed into the F tank or up on the fourth floor in the Yakima County Jail where many of the violent, violent inmates go. And on December 10th, 2018, his three fellow Norteño gang members, Felipe Luis Jr., Derek Alexander Donato, and Julian Luis Gonzalez, began attacking Jacob Ozuna and physically overpowering him, stomping him out. As he was trying to run across the tier to draw attention and save himself, the three men pounced on him again, ultimately killing him. What ensued and the story that unveiled showed the many layers, the complex thing that goes on behind the walls of jails and prisons all across this country, and how one step out of line in a particular gang can cost you your life. All three men were charged on December 13, 2018, but that was just the start of the story. A suspect in a Washington murder caught in Montana today. A six-time convicted felon and dangerous gang member, Jacob Ozuna, is a deadly shooting suspect in Yakima, Washington. Bighorn County Sheriff's Office confirms Ozuna was arrested this morning in Hardin. Ozuna has a $1 million warrant for first-degree murder, two counts of first-degree assault, and unlawful possession of a firearm. Washington News Station Q13 Fox reported Ozuna allegedly shot the victim multiple times outside of the town of Opaso earlier in May. According to Q13's report, the task force says an observant field training officer and his rookie deputy spotted Ozuna cutting, coming out of a store. Ozuna ran and the deputies were able to catch up with him, taser him, and arrest him. Inmates at the Yakima County Jail can check out tablets to take classes and watch TV shows, but they also have access to text messaging. And police say inmates accused of domestic violence are abusing that program to threaten their victims into silence. This is the second in a series of stories by Cap KB's Emily Goodell diving deep into the domestic violence epidemic in the city of Yakima. It's been two years since the Yakima County Jail used revenue from inmates' commissary purchases to buy 500 tablets from a company called Edovo. Inmates check the tablets out for free and complete educational programs in order to access music, movies, games, and other entertainment. They can even get their GED. 
I will say myself and other staff were a little skeptical uh, of the tablets, but I think at the end it has bettered the system. It's dropped violence within the jail because they're busy on the tablets. They're not, you know, m messing with each other while they're in the units. Even if they're doing it just to get to the entertainment, they're at least learning something, which in turn should make them a better community member. Inmates can also pay to use the text messaging app to contact people outside the jail. It kind of just get, opens up a little more access to let, let the incarcerated people have that, that communication with friends and family while they're in here. But the jail has faced some controversy over allowing inmates unsupervised access to texting. Unfortunately, part of that reward system is potentially being abused by some of the inmates texting their victims or other witnesses. A handful of inmates can generate thousands of texts. They're all in violation of a no contact order. Jail officials say they can review those texts and if there's a violation, they can block the victim's number or restrict text messaging for that individual inmate. But police don't get that same access. Since there's no law in the books regarding taking texts from the jail as evidence, the prosecutor is requiring them to get a search warrant. We want as, as a system to protect that evidence and make sure that it's admissible to the best of our ability, have a court rule as such, and then use it to prosecute. Police officers have asked the jail why they don't remove the text messaging app from all devices. One reason is that the jail got a discount for including text messaging, which makes money for Edovo. If the jail got rid of texting, it would cost them thousands of dollars. But mostly jail officials say they believe allowing inmates to text is helping more than it's hurting. There's always that risk of potential violations and I understand the law enforcement's concern with that. But what we can't quantify is the benefit that they might be getting from that communication with family and friends that are keeping them encouraged and getting them through a hard time that they're going through and getting them potentially out back out into the general public as good citizens. In Yakima, Emily Goodell, Cap Cave U, local news. Three siblings have been arrested in connection with a gang-related homicide that happened Friday near West Lincoln and Custer Avenues in Yakima. Cap Cave U's Emily Goodell has the story. Yakima police say three siblings, 15, 19, and 20, were shopping at High's Mini Market Friday afternoon when 30-year-old Marcos Mendoza Guillen walked in and a fight ensued. They basically recognized each other from being uh, rival gang members, and so then a physical altercation took place inside the store. After someone broke up the fight, the siblings left the store and got in their car. Then Mendoza Guillen walked out. You can tell from the video we have that the verbal altercation continued. The siblings pulled their car around to the intersection of Custer and West Lincoln Avenues, still arguing out the window as the victim got in the passenger seat of another car. They wound up pulling up behind the three suspects, at which time an exchange of a gunfire took place. Police say there were likely at least three firearms involved, but it's unclear who exactly fired the shots. The victim sustained multiple gunshot wounds and succumbed to those gunshot wounds a short time later. Police found the suspects about 4 a.m. the following morning at a house off of Old Natchez Highway north of Gleed. The deputy came across the vehicle and notified other units at which time they went on ahead and surrounded the house. Police say two of the three siblings came out quickly, but the 15-year-old stayed inside for several hours before eventually coming out without incident. We don't have all of the information as of yet. Right now, the three individuals were booked under a drive-by shooting. In Yakima, Emily Goodell, Cap Cave U, Local News. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Green Lit Gang TV. Appreciate you guys checking out the channel. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little more talking in this one, as there weren't as many news stories on this particular story. But this story was too good um, 
too good to just not not talk about. Super interesting. Uh, we're heading back to Yakima County with it. Yakima County is with it. They're with the business. Um, high, high gang population. Strong presence. Northaniel, Sereno gangs. Um, when I do a lot of research, Yakima County always pops up um, in my search history. They are always having stories come out of there. Um, this one's no different. And it was just really crazy seeing... Um, seeing, you know, how this whole thing enveloped in the many layers of this. Every time I would search something, something else would come up. Uh, you know, it's not just about the attack. Then you look at Jacob Ozuna, like I said in my intro, who he had murdered uh, in May of 2018 when he killed Dario Alvarado. He had a whole backstory himself for multiple convictions, uh, multiple crimes he'd been committed. Uh, and, you know, but the one thing I want to say before we get into this is – Nobody, nobody deserves to have their life snuffed out the way they did. Um, you know, a lot of times I get comments or I get things that say, well, they got what they deserved or let them kill each other. No, we're, we're not doing all that here. At least I don't believe in any of that. And that's what they signed up for. And yeah, to a, to a degree, okay, it is what they sign up for. But I don't care, man. They, those people have friends. They have family. They have loved ones. Even in the case of Ozuna, you know, I put up some of his family pictures, as you're going to see. He had kids. He had loved ones. He had people that cared about him. Um, and, yeah, you know, obviously did some pretty awful things. But um, that doesn't mean that you – that doesn't mean that that <laughs> – that doesn't mean that you're worthless. And that doesn't mean that you deserve to die, um, especially in this particular heinous way. So kind of get right into it, right? Jacob Ozuna was accused of killing Dario Alvarado, all right, back in May of 2018. Uh, at a house party for a going away thing on the lower valley of Yakima County. Um, an argument breaks out. He starts shooting Alvarado uh, or uh, allegedly starts shooting Alvarado because remember, he was never convicted. He was never found guilty. He never had his day in court. Um, and the reason that's so important is because they think that that played a part in why he was attacked in the Yakima County Jail. Now, there was some goings on and some back and forth about uh, who was actually a gang member, who wasn't, were some of these guys dropouts, were some of these guys, you know, active or not. And the thing is, when you say a dropout, that means somebody who's, who's in a gang and then they, you know, for whatever reason, they're X'd out by that gang, which means they're going to tell you, hey, you did this or that. We're hearing these things on the street or we're being told these things. You're done. You're out. And uh, maybe you're lucky with just getting a beating or just lucky enough to just say, hey, don't come around anymore. Or you can drop out yourself. That's what a dropout is. So if you get X'd out, they're going to choose to do that for you. Your fellow gang members are going to say, maybe you roll into the county jail. You're going to get placed into the pod with uh, the northerners or the southerners. And they're going to say, bounce. We're going to roll you up out of here. Or if for whatever reason, maybe you want to turn your life around. Uh, maybe you turn state's witness. Maybe, you know, you had some kids and you're tired of going in and out of jail, tired of going to prison. Maybe you got cleaned up. Maybe you got sober. And uh, I've seen it all being, you know, where I'm from. I've seen it all. I've got friends that are gang members. I've got friends that are uh, out, out of the gang. I've got friends that still have respect in the streets, but for whatever reason, they're not active anymore. So it's not as black and white as sometimes people make it sound or the news makes it sound. And this is one of those cases where I feel like there was other things at play that even to this day we still don't know about. Um, so Jacob Ozuna, he's there at around 1130. Okay, and a lot of times these attacks, and I, I don't know if that's exactly what it was. I, there was something going on like a roll call or a shift change. That's when a lot of times these attacks will take place in prisons and states or states. In prisons or in the county jails or city jails. The shift change, right? That's when the things are most vulnerable. That's when people are coming and going. Uh, paperwork's getting filled out. There's just maybe a little, a little more of a window to do something. And um, that's what took place. And it said for 12 to 13 minutes, Felipe Luis Jr., um, Donato, and Luis Gonzalez attacked Jacob Ozuna for 13 minutes. Uh, you know, physically beating him up. He was trying to run away. He was trying to get the guard's uh, attention. And, and sorry, I might have said those names wrong. It's Felipe Luis Jr., Derek Alexander Donato, and Julian Luis Gonzalez. Sorry, there's, some of these are longer names. So, yeah, they, they begin attacking Jacob Ozuna, who went by the name of Capone. 
And he's a lot older than these guys. The oldest one was Donato, who I believe at the time of the attack was only 24 or 25. Um, now, don't get it twisted, though, okay? The guys that did these attacks, I was able to get some background on what they had done. Uh, Julian Luis Gonzalez, he was there for a – he was basically in the Yakima County Jail on the fourth floor for an early morning shooting that happened at a Lower Valley uh, shooting uh, it was like a house party and Julian Luis Gonzalez opened fire shooting multiple victims. Um, six people were taken to a nearby hospital. Julian Luis Gonzalez was a trigger puller in that. Derek Alexander Donato, man, this guy was really, really putting in some work out there on the streets. Um, he was one that was 24, 25 years old. He had been arrested uh, for fatally shooting one man and trying to kill another. So it was back in the summer of 2017 he basically was involved in back-to-back -back shootings uh, in July, and a young man was killed. Another man was shot outside of the home. You know, so they were very active. And then it said that the leader of this attack, Felipe Luis Jr., actually the youngest one, who was only 19 or 20 at the time, um, I could not find exactly what he was in the Yakima County Jail for at that time. But he had a criminal record. He was young. You know, you can't get these guys juvenile records because they're sealed. But... These guys were with it. They were not, this wasn't their first time being violent. There wasn't, this wasn't their first time uh, attacking someone. So, and I also believe that I think Jacob Ozuna, I believe that the minute this attack started, um, I actually believe that he thought and knew this wasn't just going to be a beat down or you getting beat up. I believe he probably realized fairly quickly uh, that they were going to try to kill him. And you, they said you can see in the video the fear. You know, he's running back and forth. He's up and down the tier because, like, you're in this big pod, you know, up on the fourth floor in the Akamai County Jail from everything I read, right? You're locked up in a cell. It's kind of dorm living, but it's not. So you're behind the cell because, remember, this is kind of high violent, uh, much more high risk area. So they're in the cells for a majority of the time. Then they're let out for whatever reasons, right? Medication, you know, the locks are popped. They're let out. Now, they're in a Norteño housing unit. OK, they're in. It's like it was called F unit. And they said there were only two or three cameras like I to get this information. I actually had to read through some of the court proceedings. You can't get all of that um, just in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the newspaper articles or, you know, the talk radio articles they said they were in this F unit, two security cameras. And uh, the interestingly thing, though, is and this is this was brought up in court. This was done in plain view of the cameras. Like, they didn't go get him in his cell. There was another famous case out of Yakima County. Um, I did a video on it with Eric uh, Minion Romero. Him and some guys attacked a dude, uh, a white guy, in his cell. Uh, they murdered him and, uh, you know, claimed their gang on the wall and the victim's blood. And But that one was done in the cell, so you couldn't actually see the murder take place. Whereas this one... It was for everybody to see. And a lot of times they like to do that. It's for attention. It's to let people know we're with it. Uh, a lot of these guys are looking at 25 to life or, you know, uh, Donato's two shootings, killed a guy. Um, Felipe Luis Jr., obviously he's with it. He's trying to make a name for himself. You know, Gonzalez shot up a house party. Six people went in an ambulance. So uh, there's no, there's no, there's no hesitation uh, on the behalf of, of these of these inmates. And, and for Jacob Ozuna, he knows it. He's a career criminal. He's got multiple, multiple convictions. Um, and he, like I said, I really believe that he knew what, what was going to happen. You know, it said, <clears throat> excuse me, it said Ozuna, um, like I said, he was running up and down the tier. He was trying to get, he's trying to get everyone's attention. So now, December 9th, or around 11.30 to midnight it happens. Well, at midnight, obviously, we go into December 10th. So investigators begin to investigate it, and then they all get arrested on December 13th. Okay, so December 13th, they all get arrested. All three initially plead not guilty, so keep that in mind. Now, we're going to jump into some court readings. Yakima County Superior Court jurors watched a video Thursday of the attack that fatally injured a 36-year-old Norteño gang member at the Yakima County Jail in 2018. Prosecutors showed two videos taken inside the housing unit reserved for gang members, Norteño gang members, on the night of December 9, 2018. When prosecutors say Felipe Luis Jr. and two other gang members, and, they, and again, Felipe Luis Jr. is kind of the leader of this, and that's Derek Alexander Donato and Julian Luis Gonzalez, and two other gang members attacked Jacob Capone Ozuna. 
Now, Luis, he was charged with aggravated first-degree murder in Ozuna's death. If convicted, he had faced a mandatory life without parole. The videos began shortly after, shortly before correction officers did his hourly walkthroughs. So remember how we were talking about a shift change or something? There's movement in the jail on the part of the administration, on part of the COs. That's where things are going to take place. And that was in this case. So shortly before a CO was going to do a walkthrough of the unit and Ozuna was seen on the upper tier talking to a couple inmates through a hatch in the door of their cell. Shortly after the guard leaves, so guys, this is all planned. The video shows Luis, Derek Alexander Donato, and Julian Luis Gonzalez, whom Sheriff's Detective Brian McGrath pointed out to the jurors. They came up to Ozuna. They began attacking him with their fists and feet. At one point in the video, Ozuna runs across the upper walkway toward a door with his assailants in hot pursuit, and the attack resumes. After a couple minutes, the video shows Ozuna's attackers dragging him back across the tier by his legs, down the stairs to the lower tier of the fourth floor unit, with his head hitting off the steps each time they were dragging him down. The attack resumes. Ozuna ends up being killed. During the attack, and this is really interesting, I read this in the court proceedings, this kind of gave me, not chills, but it was just very, very, uh, a part that was left out in the news, but I found it in some of the, just when they start to appeal, all these appeals, this information comes out. So, during the attack, another inmate, Lindsey Albright, took items from Mr. Ozuna's cell and brought them back to his own cell when officers later asked for the items. Mr. Albright handed them, and among those things was a document, which is the 14 bonds of the Norteño gang, an infamous set of rules, guys. Um, if you're interested in it, just Google it right now. You can read it. It is what they live and die by. There's a strict set of rules that every Norteño gang member must follow. Um, Corrections Corporal Crystal Lip, who was the shift sergeant that night at the jail, also testified to the identity of the participants in the attack and how she joined other officers in responding to the unit after a call was put out for help in the unit. The attack lasted 13 minutes. So if you're a halfway decent defense attorney, you're going to jump all over this. Rick Smith, he questioned why an officer charged with monitoring the unit didn't see the attack sooner on a desktop monitor. And this brings in a whole other thing that a lot of times isn't talked about um, it's kind of interesting, though, because I'm watching a Vlad TV interview right now, and I encourage you guys to watch it. He's interviewing an, an ex-CEO, an ex-Army um, or Marine who was big in the corrections. Uh, he was a CEO. His dad was a CEO in California. I forget his name right off the top of my head. Just look it up. There, he, Vlad is literally releasing interviews right now with this guy, and he's talking about kind of like with police, there's a code of silence. And he's coming out and saying these CEOs – not only do they let things maybe slide, they're actively participating in this thought process, this survival mentality that takes over at these jails and at these prisons. These COs are no different. And I'm not saying they're bad people because they're not. They're in there to do a job. They're in there to try to, you know, they're in there to go home to their families. So like he talks about and like I believe happens and I experienced this doing my little time in county, fights would break out. And I'm telling you, I remember the one I was in, I sat there and watched a fight for over 10 minutes. And if any of you have ever been involved in a fight, that is a long time to go on. I mean, guys, there was breaks in this fight. And 13 minutes of beating somebody, that's a, that, that's a lifetime. I don't care what you say. That is a lifetime uh, of, of an attack. And... Uh, yeah, you know, there and, and again, this is not an attack on the Yakima County Department of Corrections or any other Department of Corrections or anything like that. They're there to do a job. I'm sure most of them are good, but not all of them. And you're not going to tell me that they're all good, and you're not going to tell me that kind of stuff does not go on. That's BS. There's been multiple stories out of Yakima County that talk about the jail, that talk about the lack of control that they have. There's videos right now you can go on, inmates fighting staff. The coronavirus outbreak was horrible. They were neglecting inmates. Um, it, it's a joke, to be honest with you. So as much as I'm saying, I'm also saying that, hey, not all these guys are bad. They have a job. Do they want to go home? They could also be 10 times better. Because stuff like this in Yakima County that I'm realizing, it, it, I'm noticing it in the Yakima County when I look it up. I'm noticing it in certain California areas. I'm also noticing it down south. I hear about prisons in Mississippi. I hear about like Angola prison in Louisiana, uh, Rikers Island, New York. And a lot of these areas, 
guys, this, this is just a mindset that breeds inside these correctional institutions. I did the story on the BGF, on the Baltimore City Jail. That guy impregnated four guards. Uh, he ran the jail. The guards liked that he was there because it kept the peace. If you guys don't think that stuff goes on inside these jails, if you think that these guards are just going to jump in every time a fight breaks out and they're there to help you while you're locked up, you are wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. And don't get me wrong. This isn't the movies. In my experience, jail is not as bad as sometimes the movies make it sound. But if you think you're safe because the staff is going to help you, you are wrong. And, and this story out of Yakima County, and there's plenty of other stories. And Yakima County is not very big. For this many stories to be coming out, there's a problem going on. I don't care what anybody says. There's a problem inside that county jail. Um, for 13 minutes for this guy to be dragged. And it's in a high security, high risk security housing. And these are some of the most highest violent offenders that that county jail has. And that kind of stuff's going on. So anyway, the attack happens, they get arrested. Now it starts coming out about maybe why it happened. Was it because Ozuna had killed, um, you know, the guy he killed at, at the house party? Was that because he killed Dario Alvarado the third, uh, you know, some months before that? So it winds its way through the court. The defense attorney does a really good job uh, for Felipe Luis Jr. Um, of basically, you know, like really showing like, hey, there was more to this story. What was really going on? Um, he also used the fight video to question the prosecution's claim that the three intended to kill him uh, for violating the gang code by killing a fellow Norteño without authorization. And that's what Ozuna did at the house party when he killed Dario Alvarado. He said Luis and the others knew about the cameras. Remember like we talked about on the, the past video I made about Eric Menin Romero, where they killed the guy, Timothy Dent, in his cell? Well, they said they could have easily done that to Ozuna, but they didn't. They said where the cameras wouldn't see them if that had been their attention. So the defense attorney, for obvious reasons, is going to argue they were just trying to beat him up. That I don't believe. Uh, I, I really don't believe that. Smith also presented – now, this is interesting. This is, goes to what we talk about, right? Smith presented two witnesses who said Dario Alvarado, whom Jacob Ozuna had killed or was charged with killing – he had earlier declared that he was a dropout from the Norteño gang. But the flip side of that, Denise Hackett, a retired corrections officer and corrections officer April Rosales, said that when Alvarado was booked into the jail in April 2018, he told them as part of his booking process that he was no longer a gang member. But they said that they can do that and then jump right back into the gang. So they'll say, yeah, I'm a dropout, but then they'll join right back up. So it's just kind of a, you know... It's a gray area. It really is. Rosales, under cross-examination, said it was possible for someone to say they had left a gang owner to return to it. Um, now, kind of some of the sentences, okay? Julian Luis Gonzalez, he entered an Alford plea to first-degree murder, which is basically like you're going you're gonna to plead to it, but you're not going to admit guilt. You're going to acknowledge that, hey, there's enough evidence to where uh, there's a good chance I would be found guilty if I continued with this. He was given 24 years. Donato, he was to undergo mental competency evaluation after he reported voices telling him what to do. Now, I, again, I don't know. Mental health is a huge thing in jail and in prison. And if you think it's not, you are absolutely wrong. Guys get institutionalized. You couple that with, with drug use, which I guarantee you is very prevalent with all of these defendants. I guarantee you all of these defendants were using drugs. Um, this whole thought that, oh, we don't do this or we don't do that, um, it's, it's BS. They absolutely do. Now, my experience when I was in county jail with the Hispanic gang members, they have no problem admitting – this is my experience. They had no problem admitting um, cocaine use. Nobody really wanted to admit to methamphetamine use. It's just a pride thing. That was my thing. A lot of them use it. Uh, a lot of them also use opiates. But a lot of them do use the stuff to get up and go. Um, they don't like to admit it, but that's very, very prevalent. And I believe that I guarantee you that stuff plays a factor. You're locked up. You're in this cell on the fourth floor. You're on drugs. Things are getting kited in all the time. Something like this happens. It all plays a factor. You're in psychosis. You probably haven't slept. And do I believe it's a ploy by the defense? Sure, but... 
regardless, um, that stuff absolutely does happen. So what ends up happening is Donato goes, he gets his, um, he gets his, gets his comments, he comes back, he ends up getting 38 years, okay? He got a long, long sentence. Remember, these guys are fighting other charges, but just on this case, that's what he got. Now, getting to what they said, who was like the leader, not the, I don't want to say the leader, he's the youngest, but the guy who kicked this off, um, Felipe Luis Jr., he's the one whose defense attorney I mentioned a lot. Super interesting with him. He's looking at first degree premeditated murder. He ends up, and man, this guy had one hell of an attorney. He ends up getting only convicted of first degree manslaughter and got 12 years in three months. Now, that's still 12 years. That's a long time. But with the time he already did, you're at the state level with the good time you're going to receive and things you can do to get out early. He's only 20, 21. The out by 30, 31. Um, so, you know, uh, big ups to his attorney. That's a hell of a job. Whether you think he did it or not, I don't care what you say. That is why we do have the best justice system in the world. Um, I believe that. I'm sure you're going to get some comments back on that, any of you in other countries. <laughs> that's just my belief. My point is, everybody is due their day in court. And that's why, actually, it was wrong for Ozuna to be murdered. So for anybody that says, well, he got what he deserved, no. Because you are due a day in court. They couldn't prove that he killed Aral. Yes, did he probably do it? Sure. But it was not proven. So anyway, there you guys have it. Much love, much appreciation. I uh, really hope you guys enjoyed this. This was a little bit longer of a talk this time. But anyway, love you guys. Thank you.